Hello, my name is Casey Clemens, and this is a Mustang Theatre Company family-friendly video. Today I will be reading part four, including chapters seven and eight of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. Chapter seven, a mad tea party. There was a table set out under a tree in front of the house and the March Hare and the Hatter were having tea at it. A dormouse was sitting between them fast asleep and the other two were using it as a cushion, resting their elbows on it and talking over its head. Very uncomfortable for the dormouse, thought Alice, only as it's asleep, I suppose it doesn't mind. The table was a large one, but the three were all crowded together at one corner of it. No room, no room, they cried out when they saw Alice coming. There's plenty of room, said Alice indignantly, and she sat down in the large armchair at one end of the table. Have some wine, the March Hare said in an encouraging tone. Alice looked all around the table, but there was nothing on it but tea. I don't see any wine, she remarked. There isn't any, said the March Hare. Then it wasn't very civil of you to offer it, said Alice angrily. It wasn't very civil of you to sit down without being invited, said the March Hare. I didn't know it was your table, said Alice. It's laid for a great many more than three. Your hair wants cutting, said the Hatter. He had been looking at Alice for some time with great curiosity, and this was his first speech. You should learn not to make personal remarks, Alice said with some severity. It's very rude. The Hatter opened his eyes very wide on hearing this, but all he said was, why is a raven like a writing desk? Come, we shall have some fun now, thought Alice. I'm glad they've begun asking riddles. I believe I can guess that, she added aloud. Do you mean that you think you can find out the answer to it, said the March Hare. Exactly so, said Alice. Then you should say what you mean, the March Hare went on. I do, Alice hastily replied. At least, at least I mean what I say. That, that's the same thing, you know. Not the same thing a bit, said the Hatter. You might just as well say, I see what I eat is the same as I eat what I see. You might as well just say, added the March Hare, that I like what I get is the same as I get what I like. You might just as well say, added the Dormouse, who seemed to be talking in his sleep, that I breathe when I sleep is the same as I sleep when I breathe. It is the same thing with you, said the Hatter. And here the conversation dropped, and the party sat silent for a minute, while Alice thought over all she could remember about ravens and writing desks, which wasn't much. The Hatter was the first to break the silence. What day of the month is it? He said, turning to Alice. He had taken his watch out of his pocket and was looking at it uneasily, shaking it every now and then and holding it to his ear. Alice considered a little and then said, the fourth. Two days wrong, sighed the Hatter. I told you butter wouldn't suit the works he added, looking angrily at the March Hare. It was the best butter, the March Hare replied meekly. Yes, but some crumbs have got in it as well, the Hatter grumbled. You shouldn't have put it in with the bread knife. The March Hare took the watch and looked at it gloomily. Then he dipped it into his cup of tea and looked at it again. But he could think of nothing better to say than his first remark. It was the best butter, you know. Alice had been looking over his shoulder with some curiosity. What a funny watch, she remarked. It tells the day of the month and doesn't tell what o'clock it is. Why should it, muttered the Hatter. Does your watch tell you what year it is? Of course not, Alice replied very readily, but that's because it's the same year for such a long time together. Which is just the case with mine, said the Hatter. Alice felt dreadfully puzzled. The Hatter's remark seemed to have no sort of meaning in it, and yet it was certainly English. I don't quite understand you, she said as politely as she could. The Dormouse is asleep again, said the Hatter, and he poured a little hot tea upon its nose. The Dormouse shook its head impatiently and said without opening its eyes, of course, of course, just what I was going to remark myself. Have you guessed the riddle yet? The Hatter said, turning to Alice again. No, I give it up, Alice replied. What's the answer? I haven't the slightest idea, said the Hatter. Nor I, said the March Hare. Alice sighed wearily. I think you might do something better with the time, she said, than waste it in asking riddles that have no answers. If you knew time as well as I do, said the Hatter, you wouldn't talk about wasting it. It's him. I don't know what you mean, said Alice. Of course you don't, the Hatter said, tossing his head contemptuously. I dare say you never even spoke to time. Perhaps not, Alice cautiously replied, but I know I have to beat time when I learn music. Ah, that accounts for it said the Hatter. 
he won't stand beating. Now, if you only kept on good terms with him, he'd do almost anything you liked with the clock. For instance, suppose it were nine o'clock in the morning, just time to begin lessons. You only have to whisper a hint to time and round goes the clock in a twinkling. Half past one, time for dinner. I only wish it was, the March Hare said to itself in a whisper. That would be grand, certainly, said Alice thoughtfully, but then I shouldn't be hungry for it, you know. Not at first, perhaps, said the Hatter, but you could keep it at half past one as long as you liked. Is that the way you manage it? Alice asked. The Hatter shook his head mournfully. Not I, he replied. We quarreled last March, just before he went mad, you know, pointing with his spoon at the March Hare. It was at the great concert given by the Queen of Hearts, and I had to sing, Twinkle, twinkle, little bat, how I wonder what you're at. You know the song, perhaps? I've heard something like it, said Alice. It goes on, you know, the Hatter continued, in this way. Up above the world you fly, like a tea tray in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle. Here the Dormouse shook itself and began singing in its sleep. Twinkle, 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 and went on so long that they had to pinch it to make it stop. Well, I'd hardly finished the first verse, said the Hatter, when the Queen jumped up and bawled out, he's murdering the time, off with his head. How dreadfully savage, exclaimed Alice. Ever since that, the Hatter went on in a mournful tone, he won't do a thing I ask. It's always six o'clock now. A bright idea came into Alice's head. Is that the reason so many tea things are put out here? She asked. Yes, that's it, said the Hatter with a sigh. It's always tea time, and we've no time to wash things between whiles. Then you keep moving round, I suppose, said Alice. Exactly so, said the Hatter, as things get used up. But what happens when you come to the beginning again? Alice ventured to ask. Suppose we change the subject, the March Hare interrupted, yawning. I'm getting tired of this. I vote the young lady tells us a story. I'm afraid I don't know one, said Alice, rather alarmed at the proposal. Then the Dormouse shall, they both cried. Wake up, Dormouse, and they pinched it on both sides at once. The Dormouse slowly opened his eyes. I wasn't asleep, he said in a hoarse, feeble voice. I heard every word you fellows were saying. Tell us a story, said the March Hare. Yes, please do, pleaded Alice. And be quick about it, added the Hatter, or you'll be asleep again before it's done. Once upon a time, there were three little sisters, the Dormouse began in a great hurry, and their names were Elsie, Lacey, and Tilly, and they lived at the bottom of a well. What did they live on, said Alice, who always took a great interest in questions of eating and drinking. They lived on treacle, said the Dormouse, after thinking a minute or two. Well, they couldn't have done that, you know, Alice gently remarked. They'd have been ill. So they were, said the Dormouse, very ill. Alice tried to fancy to herself what such an extraordinary way of living would be like, but it puzzled her too much. She went on, but why did they live at the bottom of a well? Take some more tea, the March Hare said to Alice very earnestly. I've had nothing yet, Alice replied in an offended tone, so I can't take more. You mean you can't take less, said the Hatter. It's very easy to take more than nothing. Nobody ask your opinion, said Alice. Who's making personal remarks now, the Hatter asked triumphantly. Alice did not quite know what to say to this, so she helped herself to some tea and bread and butter and then turned to the Dormouse and repeated her question. Why did they live at the bottom of a well? The Dormouse again took a minute or two to think about it and then said, it was a treacle well. There's no such thing. Alice was beginning very angrily, but the Hatter and the March Hare went shh, 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 and the Dormouse sulkily remarked, if you can't be civil, you better finish the story for yourself. No, please go on, Alice said very humbly. I won't interrupt again. I dare say there may be one. One indeed, said the Dormouse indignantly. However, he consented to go on. And so these three little sisters, they were learning to draw, you know. What did they draw, said Alice, quite forgetting her promise. Treacle, said the Dormouse, without considering it at all this time. I want a clean cup, interrupted the Hatter. Let's all move one place on. He moved on as he spoke, and the Dormouse followed him, and the March Hare moved into the Dormouse's place, and Alice rather unwillingly took the place of the March Hare. 
The Hatter was the only one who got any advantage from the change, and Alice was a good deal worse off than before, as the March Hare had just upset the milk jug into his plate. Alice did not wish to offend the Dormouse again, so she began, very cautiously, But I don't understand. Where did they draw the treacle from? You can draw water out of a water well, said the Hatter. So I should think you could draw treacle out of a treacle well. Heh, <laughs> stupid. But they were in the well, Alice said to the Dormouse, not choosing to notice this last remark. Of course they were, said the Dormouse. Well in. This answer so confused poor Alice that she let the Dormouse go on for some time without interrupting it. They were learning to draw, the Dormouse went on, yawning and rubbing its eyes, for it was getting very sleepy. And they drew all manner of things. Everything that begins with an M. Why an M? said Alice. Why not? said the March Hare. Alice was silent. The Dormouse had closed its eyes by this time and was going off into a doze. But on being pinched by the Hatter, it woke up again with a little shriek and went on. That begins with an M, such as mouse traps and the moon and memory and muchness. You know, you say things are much of a muchness. Did you ever see such a thing as a drawing of muchness? Really, now you ask me, said Alice, very confused. I don't think. Then you shouldn't talk, said the Hatter. This piece of rudeness was more than Alice could bear. She got up in great disgust and walked off. The Dormouse fell asleep instantly, and neither of the others took the least notice of her going, though she looked back once or twice, half hoping that they would call after her. The last time she saw them, they were trying to put the Dormouse into the teapot. At any rate, I'll never go there again, said Alice as she picked her way through the wood. It's the stupidest tea party I was ever at in all my life. Just as she said this, she noticed that one of the trees had a door leading right into it. That's very curious, she thought. But everything's curious today. I think I may as well go in at once. And in she went. Once more, she found herself in the long hall and close to the little glass table. Now, I'll manage better this time, she said to herself, and began by taking the little golden key and unlocking the door that led into the garden. Then she went to work nibbling at the mushroom. She had kept a piece of it in her pocket till she was about a foot high. Then she walked down the little passage and then she found herself at last in the beautiful garden among the bright flower beds and the cool fountains. Chapter eight, the queen's croquet ground. A large rose tree stood near the entrance of the garden. The roses growing on it were white but there were three gardeners at it, busily painting them red. Alice thought this was a very curious thing, and she went nearer to watch them. And just as she came up to them, she heard one of them say, Look out now, Five, don't go splashing paint over me like that. I couldn't help it, said Five in a sulky tone. Seven jogged my elbow. On which Seven looked up and said, That's right, Five, always lay the blame on others. You'd better not talk, said Five. I heard the queen say only yesterday you deserve to be beheaded. What for? said the first one who had spoken. That's none of your business, too, said Seven. Yes, it is his business, said Five, and I'll tell him it was for bringing the cook tulip roots instead of onions. Seven flung down his brush and had just begun, well, of all the unjust things, when his eye chanced to fall upon Alice as she stood watching them. And he checked himself suddenly. The others looked round also, and all of them bowed low. Would you tell me, said Alice a little timidly, why you were painting the roses? Five and seven said nothing but looked at two. Two began in a low voice. Well, the fact is, you see, miss, this here ought to have been a red rose tree, and we put a white one in by mistake. And if the queen was to find out, we should all have our heads cut off, you know. So you see, miss, we're doing our best before she comes to... At this moment, Five, who had been anxiously looking across the garden, called out, the queen, the queen, and the three gardeners instantly threw themselves flat upon their faces. There was a sound of many footsteps, and Alice looked round, eager to see the queen. First came ten soldiers carrying clubs. These were all shaped like the three gardeners, oblong and flat, with their hands and feet at the corners. Next, the ten courtiers. These were ornamented all over with diamonds, and walked two and two, as the soldiers did. After these came the royal children, and there were ten of them, and the little deers came jumping merrily along hand in hand in couples. They were all ornamented with hearts. Next came the guests, mostly kings and queens, and among them Alice recognized the white rabbit. 
It was talking in a hurried, nervous manner, smiling at everything that was said, and went by without noticing her. Then followed the knave of hearts, carrying the king's crown on a crimson velvet cushion. And last of all, this grand procession came, the king and queen of hearts. Alice was rather doubtful whether she ought to lie down on her face like the three gardeners, but she could not remember ever having heard such a rule at processions. And besides, what would be the use of a procession, thought she, if people had all to lie down upon their faces so that they couldn't see it? And so she stood still where she was and waited. When the procession came opposite to Alice, they all stopped and looked at her, and the queen said severely, Who is this? She said it to the knave of hearts, who only bowed and smiled in reply. Idiot, said the queen, tossing her head impatiently and turning to Alice. She went on. What's your name, child? My name is Alice, so please your majesty, said Alice very politely. But she added to herself, why, they're only a pack of cards after all. I needn't be afraid of them. And who are these, said the queen, pointing to the three gardeners who were lying round the rose tree. For you see, as they were lying on their faces and the pattern on their backs was the same as the rest of the pack, she could not tell whether they were gardeners or soldiers or courtiers or three of her own children. How should I know, said Alice, surprised at her own courage. It's no business of mine. The queen turned crimson with fury and after glaring at her for a moment like a wild beast began screaming, off with her head, off with nonsense, said Alice very loudly and decidedly, and the queen was silent. The king laid his hand upon her arm and timidly said, Consider, my dear, she is only a child. The queen turned angrily away from him and said to the knave, Turn them over. So the knave did so, very carefully, with one foot. Get up, said the queen in a shrill, loud voice, and the three gardeners instantly jumped up and began bowing to the king, the queen, the royal children, and everybody else. Leave off that, screamed the queen. You make me giddy. And then, turning to the rose tree, she went on, What have you been doing here? May it please your majesty, said Tu in a very humble tone, going down on one knee as he spoke. We were trying. I see, said the queen, who had meanwhile been examining the roses. Off with their heads! And the procession moved on, three of the soldiers remaining behind to execute the unfortunate gardeners, who ran to Alice for protection. You shan't be beheaded, said Alice, and she put them into a large flower pot that stood near. The three soldiers wandered about for a minute or two, looking for them, and then quietly marched off after the others. Are their heads off? shouted the queen. Their heads are gone, if it please your majesty, the soldiers shouted in reply. That's right, shouted the queen. Can you play croquet? The soldiers were silent and looked at Alice as the question was evidently meant for her. Yes, shouted Alice. Come on then, roared the queen, and Alice joined the procession wondering very much what would happen next. It's, it's a very fine day, said a timid voice at her side. She was walking by the white rabbit who was peeping anxiously into her face. Very, said Alice. Where's the duchess? Hush, hush, said the rabbit in a low hurried tone. He looked anxiously over his shoulder as he spoke and then raised himself up on tiptoe, put his mouth close to her ear and whispered, she's under sentence of execution. What for, said Alice. Did you say what a pity, the rabbit asked. No, I didn't. I don't think it's a pity at all. I said what for. She boxed the queen's ears, the rabbit began. Alice gave a little scream of laughter. Oh, hush, the rabbit whispered in a frightened tone. The queen will hear you. You see, she came rather late, and the queen said, Get to your places, shouted the queen in a voice of thunder, and people began running about in all directions, tumbling up against each other. However, they got settled down in a minute or two, and the game began. Alice thought she had never seen such a curious croquet ground in her life. It was all ridges and furrows, the balls were live hedgehogs, the mallets live flamingos, and the soldiers had to double themselves up and to stand on their hands and feet to make the arches. The chief difficulty Alice found at first was in managing her flamingo. She succeeded in getting its body tucked away comfortably enough under her arm with its legs hanging down, but generally, just as she had got its neck nicely straightened out and was going to give the hedgehog a blow with its head, it would twist itself round and look up in her face with such a puzzled expression that she could not help bursting out laughing and when she had got its head down and was going to begin again, 
It was very provoking to find that the hedgehog had unrolled itself and was in the act of crawling away. Besides all this, there was generally a ridge or a furrow in the way, wherever she wanted to send the hedgehog to, and as the doubled up soldiers were always getting up and walking off to other parts of the ground, Alice soon came to the conclusion that it was a very difficult game indeed. The players all played at once without waiting for turns, quarreling all the while, and fighting for the hedgehogs. And in a very short time, the queen was in a furious passion and went stamping about and shouting, off with his head, or off with her head, about once in a minute. Alice began to feel very uneasy. To be sure, she had not as yet had any dispute with the queen, but she knew that it might happen at any minute. And then, thought she, what would become of me? They're dreadfully fond of beheading people here. The great wonder is that there's anyone left alive. She was looking about for some way of escape and wondering whether she could get away without being seen when she noticed a curious appearance in the air. It puzzled her very much at first, but after watching it a minute or two, she made it out to be a grin. And she said to herself, it's the Cheshire Cat. Now I shall have somebody to talk to. How are you getting on, said the cat, as soon as there was mouth enough for it to speak with. Alice waited till the eyes appeared and then nodded. It's no use speaking to it, she thought, till its ears have come, or at least one of them. In another minute, the whole head appeared, and then Alice put down her flamingo and began an account of the game, feeling very glad she had someone to listen to her. The cat seemed to think that there was enough of it now in sight, and no more of it appeared. I don't think they play at all fairly, Alice began, in rather a complaining tone, and they all quarrel so dreadfully one can't hear oneself speak, and they don't seem to have any rules in particular, at least if there are, nobody attends to them, and you've no idea how confusing it is, all the things being alive. For instance, there's the arch I've got to go through next, walking about at the other end of the ground. And I should have croqueted the queen's hedgehog just now, only it ran away when it saw mine coming. How do you like the queen? said the cat in a low voice. Not at all, said Alice. She's so extremely... Just then she noticed that the queen was close behind her listening, so she went on, likely to win, that it's hardly worth finishing the game. The queen smiled and passed on. Who are you talking to? said the king, going up to Alice and looking at the cat's head with great curiosity. It's a friend of mine, a Cheshire cat, said Alice. Allow me to introduce it. I don't like the look of it at all, said the king. However, it may kiss my hand if it likes. I'd rather not, the cat remarked. Don't be impertinent, said the king, and don't look at me like that. He got behind Alice as he spoke. A cat may look at a king, said Alice. I've read that in some book, but I don't remember where. Well, it must be removed, said the king very decidedly, and he called the queen, who was passing at the moment. My dear, I wish you would have this cat removed. The queen had only one way of settling all difficulties, great or small. Off with his head, she said without even looking round. I'll fetch the executioner myself, said the king eagerly, and he hurried off. Alice thought she might as well go back and see how the game was going on as she heard the queen's voice in the distance, screaming with passion. She'd already heard her sentence three of the players to be executed for having missed their turns, and she did not like the look of things at all, as the game was in such confusion that she never knew whether it was her turn or not. So she went in search of her hedgehog. The hedgehog was engaged in a fight with another hedgehog, which seemed to Alice an excellent opportunity for croqueting one of them with the other. The only difficulty was that her flamingo was gone across the other side of the garden, where Alice could see it trying in a helpless sort of way to fly up into a tree. By the time she had caught the flamingo and brought it back, the fight was over, and both the hedgehogs were out of sight. But it doesn't much matter, thought Alice, as all the arches are gone from this side of the ground. So she tucked it away under her arm that it might not escape again and went back for a little more conversation with her friend. When she got back to the Cheshire Cat, she was surprised to find quite a large crowd collected round it. There was a dispute going on between the executioner, the king, and the queen, who were all talking at once while all the rest were quite silent and looked very uncomfortable. The moment Alice appeared, she was appealed to by all three to settle the question and they repeated their arguments to her Though, as they all spoke at once, she found it very hard indeed to make out exactly what they said. The executioner's argument was that you couldn't cut off a head unless there was a body to cut it off from, that he had never had to do such a thing before, and he wasn't going to begin at his time of life. 
the king's argument was that anything that had a head could be beheaded and that you weren't to talk nonsense. The queen's argument was that if something wasn't done about it in less than no time, she'd have everybody executed all round. It was this last remark that made the whole party look so grave and anxious. Alice could think of nothing else to say, but it belongs to the Duchess. You better ask her about it. She's in prison, the queen said to the executioner. Fetch her here. And the executioner went off like an arrow. The cat's head began fading away the moment he was gone, and by the time he had come back with the duchess, it had entirely disappeared. So the king and the executioner ran wildly up and down looking for it, while the rest of the party went back to the game. Thank you for listening to part four of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I hope you'll tune in next week to listen to part five.